the context, <coughs> x mu will always be a fixed but mm -hmm. arbitrary probability space. And I will always take t from x to x, some measure preserving transformation, that is, it preserves mu. And the whole point of non-conventional ergodic averages is that instead of taking just one transformation, we will usually take many of them at the same time. And I will always take all the functions to be bounded, just because it's this the only way to make sense in the general case, just to assume our functions are bound. So, so this is non-conventional ergodic averages. So the basic result is the classic theorem about ergodic averages, the von Neumann mean ergodic theorem. Which tells us that the classical ergodic averages converge in L2. Okay, so you take a measure preserving information, you take a bounded function, you know that the classical ergodic averages converge in L2. The purpose of the talk is to see how much does this result generalizes to the case when we have several different transformations. Okay, so I'm now going to state a general result, but before that, let me break it down into several pieces so it is more clear. So the question is, what happens with? So what can you do when you have several transformations? In which way can you interplay them? One thing you can do is consider iterations of the different transformations. So you take, for example, something like this. Sorry? No, no, no. For the moment, that would be the question. What is the condition we have to impose on the transformation to get some meaningful information? So for now, let us see what kind of, in what kind of way we want to make these transformations act. So. One basic thing we can do is just iterate them. We apply first t1, then t2, then tl to some given bound in function f, and we want to know if this converges. This is probably the less interesting way in which we can see the interplay between the transformations. What is probably more interesting is to take multiple functions, multiple functions, something like this. So you have t1, and you apply it to the first function f1, you get t2 applied to a second function, and so on. Now, this is more interesting because it's like actually talking about correlation between these different functions, which tends to be more interesting, at least perhaps from a number of theoretical point of view. For example, you, it is, as it's very well known, you can express some Reyes theorem as a question about these averages in a particular case. So you can take multiple functions. You can ask about the correlation between these different orbits, and you can also say, why should I restrict myself to linear orbits and instead, instead take for non trajectories? Trajectory. So something like this. The point is that polynomials should preserve the rigidity of the orbit, which is what we want to exploit. So something like this, where p1 and p2 are integer value polynomials. OK. So. so those are the, the three ways in which one can seek to generalize this result. And of course, the question is, since we want this, this, the conversions to take place for any choice of bounded functions, the question is, what are the conditions we have to impose on the transformations to guarantee these conversions for, for any choice of functions? So the conjecture, and it's the result we're going to talk about, is that the right condition to impose is to look at the group this transformation generate. And the condition you want in this group is that it should be nilpotent. 
And basically, the reason is because what you actually do in, when you study these things, maybe the, you, you can say it's the reason why you have this stability of the averages that they converge, is because you have, you have some polynomial structure. And it, you can morally say that nilpotent groups are the kind of groups that preserve polynomial structure. So it preserves the structure that causes the conversions. They're sort of simply false in, more general, in the more general case. So let me state the result precisely. The theorem is as follows. Let G be an important group. Of measure preserving transformations of our space. And then the averages. of this general form product j equals 1 this general thing always converges In L2, for every choice of transformations in your group, for every choice of bounded functions, and for every choice of integer valid polynomials. So you can see that this indeed generalizes the three directions. Here you have the iteration, right? You just take one function. The second case, notice that each polynomial depends both on the transformation and the function. So for example, to recover the multiple functions, you just, for the first function, take 0 on all these cases. And second function, take this. And in the last function, you already take this transformation. So it's generalized in the second case. And also, you take in any polynomial. So it's also the third case. So it's actually all the possible combinations you can make with the three direction. OK. Converges in L2. Yes. Yes. We cannot say anything about, say, point-wise conversions. So, but for conversions in L2, we now know that as long as the group is not important, you, get, you always get conversions for any combination of these things. So this is the result I will discuss. And let me make a brief comment on previous results. So I should say that, I mean, that something like this should hold was advertised by Furstenberg for a very long time. At least in the, I mean, this was open even in, even in the villain case. And certainly in that case, it was advertised for a long time by, by Furstenberg. And, but the precise statement as it is written here, it, it was in, it's in a paper of Bergson and Lieber. But it's fair to say the conjecture is actually from Furstenberg from a very long time. So, okay, so that's the background. And then let me mention just a few of the partial results. Probably the, w the, the best known of them is the result of Hoss and Kraft, which they show conversions in this case where you take one transformation and you apply it, uh, t to the n to the first function, t to the 2n to the second function, and so on, t to the kn to the k function. So yes. So this result was proven by Hoston Kra that this average is conversion L2, was a result of Hoston Kra. And subsequently, Sigler found a different proof of this result. And also, there were previous results by, by several authors, inclu including Constant and Singh on this particular case, which is particularly interesting because for once, it is the case that corresponds to Severity's theorem. So this precise case, if you take your f sub i to be the characteristic function of some set of positive density, then showing that the, 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 the limit of this, the integral of these things is positive actually is equivalent to Severity's theorem. So this case was very interesting from that point of view. And also, it is particularly interesting the work of Hosten-Krabb because they give a very nice description of the structure of the limits 
of these averages, which is very useful. And OK, let me mention a further result before I make a comment. So some years prior to this, there was the result of Fulster megabytes. They established the conversions of these averages. Again, you just take one transformation. You apply it to t to the n squared to the first function. And you apply t to the n to the second function. First number by shows that this converges. And it is not the first nonlinear result, but it actually it is also the paper where the concept of a characteristic factor is first uh, formally introduced. So it, and the concept of characteristic factor plays a crucial role in almost all the results, previous results in the literature. But actually, I will not say anything about characteristic, characteristic factors because they play no role in the proof I will discuss. But I mean, there is a drawback of not using characteristic factors, which is the fact that I cannot actually say anything about the limits. I just prove conversions. Yes, in, in general, you want to show that it conversions to the projection of the function to some specific factor. I cannot say that. But, there, but you will see that there is an al analog to characteristic factors in, in what I will discuss. Anyway, they were introduced in this work, and they were heavily used also here. And let me mention, OK. So a natural question is, why nilpotent groups? I already made a comment regarding that they preserve the algebraic structure. But uh, more precisely, there is this work of Burgess and Levin, where they actually show the following. You take the simplest possible non-conventional ergodic average that will be just take two linear transformations, different. Right? You apply the first one to some function and the second one to some other function. And they show that this converges if S and T generate a nilpotent group. It's nilpotent, uh, but that's not. Necessarily converge if they only generate a solvable group. So, in fact, later they show that actually, if you take any group of exponential growth, you can actually find two transformations such that, such that these averages do not converge. So, it is here that they actually make this precise statement that. Conversions should, in fact, hold in the general case as long as the transformations generate an ill-potent group. So that suggests why it is the right context. And OK, so that was actually the only known result in a ill-potent case, the case where you take two linear transformations. And uh, OK, the general case in which you have one transformation, so it is your group is cyclic. And that case is the only one which was completely settled. And that follows after the work of Host and Kra, and of course, Post and advice by work of Host Kra and also Lippmann. So that's the one case that was known in this generality. But now let me mention what is the most important result from the point of view of our methods. which is a result of tau, in which he shows quite a general statement, which is that I hope you can read this. They show that he shows that the in the linear case, if, if the polynomials are linear and your group is abelian, then in fact you have conversions in that generality. So if you take uh, something like this and you assume your transformations actually commute, then in, then in fact he shows conversions. So 
abelian group and linear polynomials. Now, I said this is the most important result from the point of view of the methods, and the reason that is, is that it is the, on the first result which does not use characteristic factors. So he actually used a different approach, which again does not say anything about the limit, but actually allows you to do some things that just become too complicated if you really want to go through the characteristic factors. So this is an important result. And there were some more recent results. By, by several people, the, the probably the, the two more, one very interesting recent result is Austin. He shows conversions in the case, in a par very particular case, but he actually shows what the limit is. And there's also results of two, Francis Genghis and Host, showing that this in the case where the polynomials have different degrees. So that was the state. And then you have the general result that I said previously. So remaining of the talk, let me discuss the proof how the proof goes of the general result. So, okay, so the proof has three steps. The first one is a, a very classic step to take. It's just take a, what is called a structure, see the randomness of the composition. I'm sorry? Will you know about Umar score? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, this method does not seem to be well suited to that question. Uh, we only have the results of gain in the case of pointless conversions. But it's not clear if one can say much more. So, but to prove normal conversions, you have three steps. You take a structure, see the random decomposition. You, what is the purpose of this? You define you you divide, you want to study whether the averages converge for a certain function. You decompose it into two pieces. One piece is pseudo random, and actually you expect that that will, will be sufficiently wild that it will converge to zero, so it will be nice. And the other piece has some structure. With in this particular case, what it means is something that we call reducibility, which means that for this function, applying certain transformations looks like applying some other transformations. So in the end, what that tells you is that you can pass from the original system. You take away the random part. The structure part looks like if you are actually in another system. And what you try to do is actually realize that that other system is simpler than the original system. So you use this to actually get an induction so that you reduce it to a, a case in which the result is trivial. So again, you start with your function. You take the random part away. The structure allows you to reduce it to a simpler system. And then you apply induction. Right, yes. OK, we will come to that. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yes, the structure part will correspond to will be the projection to a character factor, but it is actually more s a little bit softer than that. So that's the idea of how to take advantage. <coughs> OK, so so let me discuss something that is very classical, which is this structure randomness idea in a very abstract context. Which is the following. OK, we are in L2. What I say can apply to any Hilbert space. You take some set sigma in L2, which is your set of the bounded set, bounded set of structure functions, whatever that means. And so actually structure can mean whatever you want. So the idea is precisely that, how you take in, you, you have some problem, you decide what the structure is for your problem, and you actually want to decompose your function into something that looks like that structure that is important for your problem, and something that does not look at all like something on the structure of your problem. So this is very, actually, a very simple thing. What we want to do is write every bounded f as 
something like this. Sum, the sum of lambda sub j times sigma sub j plus g, where each sigma g belongs to your set of special functions. The sum of the coefficients is actually bounded, actually in a way that is independent of the choice of your set. And OK, so this will, the point of this is that you define what are your structure objects. And if your problem has sufficiently has sufficient additive structure, you expect that if you take something that is very structured and you sum it with something that is very structured, you actually get something that is also quite structured. So the idea is that you define your special set, and you want to consider a structure something that is a small combination of things in your set. So, so that will be the idea. This will be the structure part of your function. And then g will be random, which in the context of a Hilbert space has a very nice definition. What you can take to be zero random is just something that has a small inner product with every element of your special set. So this is, let's say, very small, because you really want to make this much more than this. Very small for every sigma in your special set of structure functions. So you want something like this. You want to divide f into a part that is a few, uh, sum of a few pieces of your special set and something that does not look at all like something in your set. This will be the zero random part. You cannot do this exactly as, uh, as is stated, but you can as long as you actually admit some one more term, which is a smaller term. error, something like the to norm of h being less than some prescribed epsilon. So okay, so this is the classical decomposition. It's like just taking a, a Fourier decomposition, right? You, the, the, the sigma sub j will be the large Fourier characters, and then the other thing just have very small characters. But you can do this in the generality you want. You just define your, your associative mass you want, and you can decompose any function to sum of a few elements of sigma and something that does not look like something in sigma. So that's an easy result. It's easy to prove, actually. It's worth mentioning that it's uh, a very nice geometrical proof by Gowers of the statement as it is written there using the Hamanach theorem. But I will not discuss that. But actually, that is the using the idea of Gowers. They are very flexible. And, you, and the nice thing is that you can get the composition like the one above, but with more properties. I mean, maybe you want to have more information in your decomposition. And that is what we will exploit in our proof. So the actual statement we need for non-conventional ergodic averages is something in the following setting. Instead of just having one set of structure functions, you actually have a whole uh, chain of structure elements. So sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma n, sigma plus 1. It these sets, the idea is that these sets become more and more and more structured the larger the value of n is. So when you want to do this decomposition, you obviously want to place your special elements in the largest value of n possible. In sigma n for the largest, largest possible value of n, because your element will be more and more structured, the larger the value of n is. So you can say, why I just simply, if I want to do that, I, maybe I, sh I should just simply take some large value of n and do the thing that we did above with that sigma n. The problem of doing this is that if you look at the definition of, if you can see it, and you look at the definition of what is to be pseudo random, it means that it does not look like an element of sigma. If you pick a large value of n, then this will be a, se a set of very structured functions. It will be a very restricted set, very small set. So if you say that a function does not look like an element of this very restricted set, you're actually not saying much about, about your function. So it, as larger the value of n is, it is better for the structure part. It is just worse for the random part. So what you want to do is to get a decomposition in which you can guarantee that the structured part belongs to sigma n for some large value of n. So it is very, very structured. While the random part does means that it does not look like an element of sigma n for some very small value of n. So it is very pseudo random. So you want to do, you work to, what you really want to do is work with two different scales at the same time. So that's what you want. And that you can do. You fix some integer m. And write 
what you can do is write every bounded s as before where now sigma sub j belongs to sigma b so it is belongs to sigma b for some b much larger than m so it is really very structured in terms of your parameter m again the sum is just bounded And now, G does not look like an element of sigma thermal for every sigma in sigma A, where A now is much smaller than your parameter M. So this is really very pseudo-random. And, uh, and again, H is just a smaller return. OK, so this is precisely the composition, or almost precisely the composition that we need for non-conventional ergodic averages. You just can take a structure part at one scale and a pseudo-random part at a very, di very different scale. And I will soon explain why that is important. So that's about it for the first step. You assume the norm of f is less than 1. And then it is bounded by an absolute constant that is independent of your choice of sigmas. That, that is the important part. That is independent of your choice of special functions. OK. So that's the structure of the random part. You can make divide your function into something that is really very structured and something that is really very pseudo-random. So the second part of the proof is what I termed the concept of reducibility. Uh, yes, yes, if you, it's not really that complicated. You can actually use the arguments of Gowers, something similar to that, to get a decomposition like that. The only little light that there is there is that you cannot really fix the integer m. You just have to allow for a large range. But it's morally, it is true what I said. There. So second part. OK, so this is abstract thing. You have a structure part, still a random part, but for the particular problem, it does not, does not help you because you really have to define what is the structure part for your problem. So that's what, yes? So this abstract thing is proportional to any Hilbert space? Any Hilbert space, yes. So yes, you have the statement for any Hilbert space. And now, when we really want to study non-conventional ergodic averages, we really have to see, to define what is the structure for non-conventional ergodic averages. So. So OK, so let's consider a particular ergodic average. Something like this. Where t and s commute. OK, so we will now focus on this particular case. And the ideas are pretty much the same as in the general case. So it had two commuting transformations. You take one along the squares and another one along linear. So, and along linear. So, and you have two bounded functions. Maybe I can give you a nilpotent. Uh, I exp explain the nilpotent thing at the end. Yes. But for now, let us concentrate on this case. And so we have this case. And we want to define the structure. What is the structure? I, I mean. The f we want to decompose it into some of something structured with respect to this average and something that is either random. So what is the structure part? It's hard to tell at first sight. So what is good about this is that the, the ideas of structure and pseudo random are really dual to each other. So what you can do is maybe it is easier to think in an intuitive way about random things. So you can say what happens if f is actually random, and then take the structure to be the opposite of what happens in that case. So so okay, again. If this is a personal point of view, but I will imagine that if f is, I mean, you're going along very rigid orbits. You're taking a one transformation, some other different transformation. I will imagine that if f is really pseudo random, then it will oscillate so widely that there is no way that something as structured as an orbit can catch the behavior of this orbit along the squares. I will imagine that f is truly pseudo random, then this thing should go to zero as n goes to infinity. So one can debate about that, but 
we will take essentially that as a definition of zero random, which is also very convenient because it easily gets rid of the zero random part because it just converges to zero. So this is a bit of a simplification, but morally it is like that. You define something to be zero random if f will be zero random if this goes to zero for any choice of g, for any choice of g. So the question is, what happens? If the L2 norm of this does not go to zero, so say it is bounded away by some epsilon, if this is bigger than epsilon, for some large value of n. So if it is zero random, it should go to zero. What happens if this actually does not go to zero? It is bounded away from zero for some large bare value of n. So so let me do let me simplify things a little by instead of assuming that the L2 norm is bounded away, that actually the integral of this average is bounded away from zero. Actually. Uh, again, morally, it's just the same. You will easily see how to do it in the L2 case, but let me discuss it in the slightly simpler case in which the integral does not go to zero. So right. I will take my functions to be real values. So this is just this, the integral of f against g. So we are assuming that epsilon is less than So let's assume the integral does not go to zero. So in that case, you know, if you can read what it says there, then you know that epsilon is, that the integral of these averages are greater than epsilon. So let's do something very, very, very elementary, simple things. So this is greater than epsilon. Then I just rewrite this. I take the expectation outside, expectation outside and rewrite it in this way. So this is just the same thing. And now, in the analog of this, in the, in the real case, but it is the only place in the proof when one actually uses that deformations preserve the measure. So it is really only at one place that you're using that deformations preserve the measure. And it is in the analog of this step, where you actually show that this is just the same thing as this. T preserves the measure, so this is the same as this because it preserves the integral. And then you just take the expectation inside. It seems a very silly thing to do, but I will explain why it is useful. OK. So. We started with the assumption that the integral remains away from zero. And what we concluded is that f has some correlation with an average like this. And of course, an average of things is, tends to be more robust than a single element. So maybe you can say something about f by knowing this correlation. So let's see what we can say. So we, oh, the idea is that we define a function to be structured if it looks like this thing that f is correlating with. So f, if f is structured, the zero random part is easy, just go to zero. If f is structured, then it will look like this thing here. And what we can do this, what we can do now is move the box a little, which will correspond uh, intuitively to differentiate your averages. You're averaging over a very large value of n. So f looks like a large ab average for a large value of n. And suppose you have a small value of h. So you average, you average along an interval of n. And what you do is you move this box by h. So you move it very little. Of course, the functions are bounded. So by moving this very little, you do not expect the average to change much. You have an average in h. And if you move it a little, it will be the same average. So this will look pretty much like this. So the sum goes up to n of t minus n plus h squared s n plus h g. Now why is this useful? 
Here is where morally we are using the fact that we have can make the compositions at two different scales. So what we do is that in practice, we are actually interested in this range. We want to show that in the range of a small value of h, the average does not change much, the average we are studying. So that actually will imply conversions. It never changes much, then it actually converges. So we are actually worried about this range. So what we do is actually go to a very, go to the infinity, let's say, pick the information about f from there, that it actually has to correlate with something like that if it does not converge. And then take that information at a very large scale back to our small scale that we are studying. So because notice that actually, if you wanted to show that f was pseudo random, it has not to correlate with something like that for some scale. And the structure part corresponds to a larger scale. So just want to emphasize that the, the, this is where you actually use that you have the composition at different scales. And that is crucial. Because you, I mean, one of the difficult things about using characteristic factors is that if you want to do it by the ergodic theory, you just cannot because you cannot simply go to the infinity and get the information there. You really have to work on these uh, restricted scales. So this is important. And so if you take as h small, so what happens now? You only care about this range. And now remember that f, you were applying t to the h squared to f. So what does this look like now? t h squared of f, f looks like this. Then t squared of f would simply look like t something like this. OK, I'm just applying t to the h square. But now this is the, the, the scale we care about, h. And in terms of h, this, all this is just linear in h. Like yes, yes, it certainly is like that. So what you get is that in this smaller scale, applying t to the h square to f is just applying an average of linear things. So in some sense, your average has become simpler by doing this. So in the end, the structure for your function is that applying t to a square looks like applying linear things. That will be the structure part of your function. So did you actually reduce the charge? You no. Uh, actually, it, it is simpler even in the case. Actually, one thing I did not mention is that one of the advantages of this proof it, th is that it is much, much simpler than all the previous results in the literature. So it actually gives much simpler proofs of all the previous results, including the Tau's result which already was uh, a level simpler than the other ones. So, so you have that. And now what you need to do is in that. So the last step goes like this. So let me consider the general case. So you have g1, gj. For a moment, let me go to the general case so that you can see what happens. G is just a group of measure preserving transformations. So this is a sequence of measure preserving transformations. And you consider the general average along the sequence. Uh, G1n, f1, G2n, f2, Gjn, fj. So these are the different directions in which you go to f1. You average along g1, f2, you average along g2, and so on. In the particular case we were studying, then we were taking uh, g1 to equal t to the n squared, and g2 to equal sn, s to the n. OK, so that was the particular case we were studying. Now we consider the general case. What does this strategy tell you at the end? What you get at the end is that conversions you want to show conversions for this system, right? You have g1, t2, tjn. And now you know that this will follow. By the above reasoning, you conclude that this will follow from knowing conversions for g1, gj minus 1n, gjn, gj n plus h to the minus 1. Then they put n plus n to the minus 1. Uh, gj n gj n plus n to the minus 1 applied to g1 of n plus n, so on, so on, until the last one, which is gj of n applied to gj of n plus n minus 1, gj minus 1 n plus n. And you want to show that this converges for every j of n. So you were trying to study 
these averages, where you have j sequences, arbitrary sequences, and you have reduced by the above reasoning to the case, to this case, in which you have these sequences that look complicated because it is not that just you reduce to one sequence, but you actually have to prove conversions for an infinite number of these sequences for every value of n. And actually, you have twice as many transformations, so it does not look something nicer. But the nice thing is that, as we saw before, whenever gj appears here, it is actually being differentiated. So it is always some different kind of differentiation going on. So it boils down to the question of what is better, to have this or to have this are twice as large, or to have infinitely many, but actually gj appears differentiated. So let me, so let me just explain why this, is, why this actually works is that the good thing about this process is that it does not generate new things of higher degree. So say your gi of n is actually something like t to the n to the d t1, t2 to the n to the d minus 1, and so on. So this is your higher degree term. And here's tl to the n, td to the n. So the point is that when you do this, you are differentiating the highest degree term. And what you get it's always some transformation that was there before. So you, the new highest degree transformations had to be there before. So by this process, you do not generate new highest degree transformations. And actually, what has to do with the deg highest degree transformation that corresponds to JG, JG, you can actually control that and actually make that disappear. So at the end, you make the transformation you choose. You choose one highest degree transformation. You make it disappear. You end up with an enormous amount of systems, but, has, but now has one number less of highest degree transformations. So you proceed in that way until you get tons of families, but of simpler degree. OK, so that's what happened there. So let me give you, show you how this works in the case we were discussing. And if I had time, I'd show you a bit of how the nil potent thing appears. So let me do this in sample just to convince you that it actually makes sense to do this. So you start with this. And if you do the above process, you keep the first transformation. I mean, this will be just manipulation, so really I won't. I will just show you that you can actually go to the trivial system. So you differentiate this one. It gives you something like this, 2n n minus n squared. And the same thing applied to s n plus n. Remember that we now care what well, the variable that we care about is n. So all this, every one of this is linear in n. So this is just, I can rewrite this as Sn un bn, where s u b, let's say that s and t commutes to simplify, as before. So we now reduce a quadratic case by one step just to the linear case with tr three transformations. This is a case that was handled by Tao, but you can, as I said, you do it easily with the strategy. You can, from if you apply the same step here, then you actually get b minus n as n plus n, b minus n, u n plus n, and and also you have a b minus n here. Now the point is that you don't really care about constant because you are averaging. So you are applying, so you are averaging something that is uh, constant that is fixed. You don't average in anything, so you don't care about constants. So this constants goes away. And here, because these things commute, I can also absorb the constants to the function I'm studying. So I don't care about this either. And at the end, what I have is that this is just having two transformations. So it's nice that by applying one step, you immediately remove one transformation one by one. You do the same thing again. And then you can apply for Neumann theorem. You don't want to apply for Neumann theorem. You do this again. You get the identity transformation. So that's the commuting case. and. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. I hurried a bit, so I can show you at least one new potent example. <laughs> so let me finish giving you, showing you how this fits with new potent groups. Again, of course, in the time remaining, I will not be able to say much. This is kind of vaguely reminiscent of that work of Burgess and Leibniz. Yes. 
yes, I, this certainly also is completely trivial, that nobody observed it. But uh, the thing is that there is the Bergelson patent action. And since I never actually need it, I don't know exactly how it goes, but I do know by talking to other people the that the Bergelson patent action is actually a partial ordering on the possible systems. Yeah. And it seems that this satisfies the same partial ordering, but I just go in a different direction in this partial ordering. So that's what was explained to me. Okay. Polynomial in a weekly mixing case, yes. But the thing is that here you actually can go in a different direction because of the definition of reducibility that you take. The whole point is to reduce the complexity. Yes. That's the only thing you keep in sight, basically. But it's OK. And so let's ch I, I just want to show how this fits nicely in a Newton case. So take the simplest average, the one by Bergson and Lehman, S and T n, with S and T generating a Newton group. So if you do this, you get to Sn uh, t minus h, t minus h, s h plus n. Again, you don't care about constants. And you just, uh, what I will do, the problem here is that in the abelian case, I will absorb this into the function. In a nilpotent case, these things just do not commute, so I cannot absorb them to the function. So I will rename this as c. This is a constant transformation. So I get to Sn, c, Sn. And what happens now? When you do this again, you end up with Sn, C, Sn, S minus N minus N, C minus 1. So again, this is a constant, doesn't matter. And C, S minus N, C minus 1, S, N plus N. So it seems that you're not getting anywhere unless you just simply realize that this here is nothing else than the commutator between C minus 1 and Sn. Yeah. So this is just, so OK. So this belongs to T1, from the lower central series. And of course, now you take this to be your new constant. And you end up with Sn and what is this? C minus 1. Sm1 minus 1, Sm2 to apply to Sn. And of course, this lies now in T2. And so you just, if you're in your potent case of R steps, you take your R steps and you end up with Sn, Sn. And again, from here, you just go to the trivial system. And that's the way you're done. OK, that's it. Thank you.